Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. Love you for all that you are, all that you mean. There's nobody like you. Nobody compares to you, God. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives, God. As we study, help us to have clarity and wisdom in the things that we study. Bless my mouth. Bless the ears of the listeners. Bless all to be well. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Wilderness worship. And what does that look like? What does wilderness worship look like to us? So what we were discussing was the fact that even when you're in a dry place or a wilderness place or a desert place or a obstacle place, a tough time, all those type of things, just like what we came out of in 2020, even when you're in a place like that, you are still expected to function in worship because God is still worthy. And so we talked about many of the benefits of actually worshiping in the wilderness and worshiping in that type of uh, space and uh, mind frame and space mentally. Because it's, it's easy uh, mentally to check out when you're in trouble. And uh, the first place we check out from is God. And so we're trying to reverse that saying, the first place we should run to actually is God and not the first place we should run from. It's easy to run away from God in trouble because God is something we can't see. So it's easy to turn to things that we know, whether it's alcohol, drugs, sex, uh, just Netflix and chill or just whatever, shopping. But certain things, certain wilderness experiences it requires for you to connect with God. And so we're trying to learn how do we worship in the wilderness. So let's go back and look at that again. Worshiping in the wilderness. All right, let's look at our first verse that we have. Luke 4, 1. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. One of the first things that we talked about is in Jesus' case, he was actually led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So don't assume that following God and being led by the Spirit means you always will be led into easy places. Sometimes you will be led into difficult places on purpose by God because those difficult places, oftentimes they're designed to grow you up. They're designed to develop the fortitude you need for the journey that you're headed on. So oftentimes we are actually led into the wilderness. I want to go back to that scripture. I want to point something else out. It says Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan. Now, the Jordan uh, River, of course, it was a river in that day. But when you look at the children of I Israel and the time that, that they were around, that uh, the Jordan River was something that actually was like an obstacle uh, in Joshua's day the Jordan River function just like the Red Sea where they actually had to cross over it. So imagine, spiritually speaking, you have to cross over a Jordan. You have to deal with the Jordan. You have to deal with all that uh, the Jordan brings. Uh, in Kings, it talks about the J Jordan being muddy, being dirty. In uh, Joshua, it talks about them having to cross over it. So think about all of that in this scripture. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan. He was already in not the best place spiritually. I'm not talking about li the literal Jordan, but spiritually speaking, think about that, not really being in the best place and then being led into the wilderness. One of the troubles that we have is the scripture says we go from faith to faith and from glory to glory, but it feels like we go from one bad experience to another bad experience one crappy place to another crappy place. And looking at this scripture, that looks like that was the progression. But the thing that I want to point out, it says he was full of the Holy Spirit and he was led by the Spirit. So the key is what you carry on the inside of you is better than whatever landing place you may be in temporarily, momentarily. All of our troubles have expiration dates. All of our troubles are not to be outlasting forever, eternal. They are momentary. Whether it's brought on by us, brought on by the devil, or brought on by the spirit of God, whatever we are in, it's momentary. And so how we function in those places says a lot about us 
and said a lot about our future and our journey. So let's switch to the next verse. Verse two, wherefore 40 days he was tempted by the devil. So it goes from bad to worse. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. So he is being led by the spirit into this place. And then he's tempted by the devil. And in the process of him being tempted by the devil, he is expected to consecrate himself, expected to discipline himself. A better way to say it, he was expected to deny himself. So he's already kind of gone from bad to worse. Now, let's think about this in terms of Jesus, the real person, the real person, Jesus. He leaves heaven and comes to earth. So number one, anything he does on earth is a letdown. Nothing on earth is as great as heaven. Not only that, but he shows up in a manger. He shows up of, of the worst of circumstances. Now, when he starts his ministry, uh, he, he could have at 12, he, at 12, he was in the temple and had enough wisdom to be leading the leaders at 12, but he humbled himself and went with his mother. And so for 18 years, we don't hear much about him. And then here he shows up, uh, and one scripture uh, says he shows up in the synagogue and he reads a scripture. But not long after that, here we see him going through this process, through this journey that doesn't seem favorable. It wouldn't be favorable for us as humans, but for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to be humble that low, not only uh, his start off in a manger in the barn with animals and then happen to humble himself with his mother when he could have taught the teachers at 12, 18 years later at 30, he starts his ministry off and it's going in this direction. It seems to be going from one trouble, one trial, one obstacle to the next. And on top of that, he's expected to deny himself. On top of that, he's expected to walk in discipline. On top of that, he has normal desires. The Bible says he was hungry. So this is what I want you to understand Worshiping in the wilderness is not just a command, it's an escape. It's an escape for us because life, especially when you're doing something major, life can be stressful, full of stress. And many of the stops on your journey are filled with stress. And sometimes it's compound stress, stress on top of stress. And then you're trying to discipline yourself you're trying to buckle down. You're trying to deny yourself basic needs and pleasures. And all of that can be very frustrating because on top of all of that, you're being tempted by the devil. And so the mind says, God, you expect me to worship in all of that? I mean, like you're asking a whole lot, God, but that's not really how we should frame it in our mind. We should frame it as I get to worship because there's only one person in this entire universe who understands exactly what I'm going through. Everybody else, I have to try to explain it. And have you ever been in a situation where you can't even articulate what you're feeling? You know what you feel, but you can't even tell it. Somebody says, well, go see a therapist. Well, I'd like to see a therapist, but I can't even tell my therapist what I'm feeling. But God knows everything. He knows things that you've forgotten about. And so worshiping in the wilderness can be an escape for you because you're talking to the only one who truly understands. He understands why you are where you are. He understands if you are there by your own choices, your own mistakes, because sometimes our wilderness is our own mistakes, but sometimes we are there by his will. He has led us there. He understands everything, so we might as well talk to him. We might as well express to him. We might as well invite him in, ask him the questions. I'm not saying that we don't do other steps as far as therapy, maybe going to church, reaching out to people, but there's only one person in the entire universe that is with you 24-7. Even when you are asleep, he is there. So any thoughts, worshipful thoughts that you think toward him, it's not an extra, um, it's not an extra thing on your plate to do. 
it's actually something of a bit of a relief. And when you understand that, it'll help you know that worshiping in the wilderness is a good thing for us to do. Let's go back to that verse. Where for 40 days, he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. He had hunger, natural hunger. Let's look at verse three. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Number one, the devil always tries to kick you when you're down. Number one. Number two, he always comes to you at the point of your weakness. It's not a temptation if it's something that you don't like or if it's something that you aren't weak to. That's what makes it a temptation. You know, it's not really a temptation for me to eat chitlins. I don't like them, never have liked them. That's not tempting to me. But there's other things that are very tempting because I am weak in those areas. When it comes to food, cookies and sweets, that's tempting to me. So if I'm on a diet, you can't tempt me to break my diet with chitlins. If I'm on a fast, you can't tempt me to break my fast with chitlins. However, if I'm on a diet or I'm on a fast, you can tempt me with sweets because that's something that I enjoy. So the devil is going to, number one, kick you where you're down. Number two, he's going to come to you at the point of your weakness. Not all of our weaknesses are our fault. Sometimes our weaknesses are a culmination of other things. Sometimes uh, people's choices that they've done have put us in a place where we're weak. For example, um, parents who have adult children. Sometimes your weakness is your children, but it's not because you're just weak to your children. You're weak to the choices that they make. So they make choices that put them in trouble that hurts you. So now you walk around with fear. So the devil can tempt you to worry about your children, not because of anything you've done wrong, but because of some of your children's past choices. They made choices that have put them in places that have adversely affected your life. So now the devil can threaten you with that weakness, but that wasn't a weakness that you chose. Someone else chose that for you. When your child robbed the bank and spent 15 years in prison, that did something to you. Now they're out of prison, and every time they say, I lost my job, you're worried. Are they going to go do something stupid? Are they going to rob somebody? That is the devil tempting you, but it's not your fault that you're tempted even there because that wasn't your choice. You didn't tell your child to rob the bank. You understand what I'm saying? So sometimes our weaknesses are off our fault. Sometimes they're other fault. Sometimes they're passed down through our generation. But Satan always comes at the point of our weakness, always tries to kick us where we're down. But this is the point I want to make. And so I'm going to go back to the scripture. What he says is, if you are the son of God. So those temptations that he sends our ways, the testing that he comes, even though he comes to kick us when we're down, he comes at the point of our weakness. The major goal that he is after is to challenge our sonship, challenge our standing with God or our relationship with God to put that in jeopardy and to give us the second thought, if you are the son of God, or if God loved you, you wouldn't be going through this. If you were a better person, you wouldn't be dealing with this. He's always trying to challenge us in the place that makes us think, number one, God thinks less of us, or number two, we should think less of God. If he can't get us to believe that God thinks less of us, he'll try to get us to believe that we should think less of God. If you are the son of God, you should do this. If you are the son of God, this should happen. If you're so saved, why you're broke? If you've been praying to God, why hasn't he answered? If, 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 if you had enough faith, your loved one wouldn't have died. If you were a better parent, your child wouldn't have robbed a bank. If, 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 so he's bringing all these things but it's trying to challenge our standing, 
trying to challenge us in our mental capacity of where we are with God. That's his goal because he's always trying to separate us from God, separate us from God or God from us. The scripture says nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So what he has to do, he has to get us to separate ourselves from God, walk away from God or stop believing all kinds of things. But in those times, many times what we do is we just grin and bear it because we assume God knows about it anyway. I'm waiting for him to come and fix it. If he don't fix it, maybe Satan is right. Maybe he doesn't care. What about instead of waiting for him to fix it, what about we invite him into the space with our worship? God, I'm going through. God, I feel like a failure. God, this is tough. This is difficult. But if anybody can fix it, you can. So God, I welcome you in this situation. God, I need your help. See, we are inviting him in. The Bible says in, uh, that Jesus, when he taught the disciples how to pray, he said we should pray in a manner like this. He gives us a lot of things, but then he makes this statement. He says, say, give us this day our daily bread. So it says, even though God is all-knowing, he knows what we need, that it's our job to invite him in to our daily situations, our daily circumstances. Now, sometimes your daily circumstance is based on what has happened in the past. So you're like, God, I already know what I'm going through. Yeah, he, he may know, but as a relationship, it's okay to talk about it day to day. Yeah, yeah. Let's go back to the example of, of a, a child robbing a bank and, and they're out. Let's say it's a husband and a wife and they're worried about their child. I wonder, will they do something stupid again? They've tried to warn them, but they don't know. But that doesn't mean that they don't talk it out amongst each other and say, you know what? Hey, I'm, I'm concerned about Johnny. I'm concerned about what he was doing. Yeah, you know what? I'm concerned about this too. I don't know what we're going to do, but they talk it out. That's what friends do. So worship is understanding that God is your friend. Yes, he's your creator. Yes, he's your master. But at the end of the day, he's your friend. And worship says, I'm going to invite him into my daily trouble. God, give me today my daily bread. I don't know how I'm going to face today. Whew, today is hump day, and I need you to help me to get over the hump. I, you are inviting him, him. That's what Satan doesn't want you to do. He wants to separate you and give you all these if, ifs, and ifs. But instead of just thinking of those things and worrying on those things, you might as well talk to God about it. You know what? God, sometimes I feel like you're not there for me. Oh, no, I can't say that. You can't question God. Why not talk to him? That is worship. Because you are worshiping him with your lifestyle, you're saying, God, I believe you have the answer. Right now, I'm the one that's confused. So we're going to talk it through. I'm going to tell you where I am presently. Where I am presently, I don't feel like you got my back, God. But I'm not going to tell anybody else that. I'm not going to agree with Satan. I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to give you a chance to prove me wrong. That's what I mean by worshiping in the wilderness. It's being truthful. It's being honest. And sometimes the responses that God gives you will change your life. Sometimes he doesn't answer audibly, and very rarely does he answer audibly. But all of a sudden, inside of you start thinking, you know what? I should probably go to therapy. That didn't just come out of the air. Then you, you, you look at something on YouTube and all of a sudden your favorite person that is being interviewed, you love Denzel Washington. He talks about a time where he went to therapy. That's God giving you your answer. He's leading and guiding you. And what he's doing, he's pushing Satan out of the way and he's fixing the situation for you. But it takes you coming into that place where you're willing to worship him in the wilderness. All right, let's go back to the scripture. If you are the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. So there's always a command that Satan wants us to do to prove we are what we say we are, but he's not our boss. So we shouldn't be listening to him. Let's go to verse four. Jesus answered, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone. 
Now, I could get into detail on why Jesus said what he said back, but I, I don't want to do that. I want to just generally look at what he's saying and apply that to the conversation that we're having right now. He responds, man shall not live by bread alone, which is exactly what I'm saying to you. His response is that my greatest need is not a natural need. Yes, right now I'm naturally and physically hungry, but the core of who I am as a man, the core of who I am as a woman, the core of who I am as a, as a human is not going to be satisfied by natural means. So I understand what you're bringing to me, Satan. And yes, it is tempting. It is a temptation. But the reason why I'm not biting on it is because I understand that my real source doesn't come from anything that you can offer or anything you can point me to. Man does not live by bread alone. My life source, the nucleus, the core of my life is not driven by natural means. Man shall not live by bread alone. Let's go to uh, this other verse here. Well, let, let me read, read that. Wilderness worship is standing on the word even when you're weak, which is what we see that Jesus was doing. He was standing on the word even in the place where he was weak. And so uh, I, I still want to go back to the scripture because I, I want I want to kind of dig dig in it just a little bit. So we're going to go back to that. Jesus answered, "It is written, man shall not live by bread alone." So man shall not live by bread alone. Shall not function by bread alone. Shall not function by the normal, the necessary, we, we have, uh, th there's another uh, scripture that Jesus said, I think this will help me explain it. Jesus said, uh, I have meat that you know not of. So the disciples are like, oh, where you been, Jesus? And have, have you been eating? They, they were wondering. He's like, I, I have meat that you don't understand. In other words, I get fed by sources that you don't understand. For many of us, worship feeds us. And so we can go through a bad situation. We can find out about a loved one passing and go and turn on worship music and just listen to it and think about God and cry. And someone is saying, man, why are you thinking about God? He, if he's so great, why didn't he keep your loved one alive? But man doesn't live by bread alone. See, see you, you can, maybe you can function by complaining to God and and making God the problem, making God the issue. But I, I can't live that way. My nucleus, the core of who I am, is me connecting with my creator continually. So even though I don't understand what he's done, I would rather be in his presence confused than be outside of his presence with all the answers. Because I'm fed and I'm fueled by his presence. So God, if I just got to lay here confused and cry, I'm turning this music on. I'm going to let it play. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to be in your presence. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense, but I would rather be with you because I'm the type of man that doesn't live by natural sources. I get my greatest strength by spiritual things. So sometimes that means I've got to distance myself from humans because they can't feed, feed me. This is my safe self from natural relationships because they can't feed me right now. I'm not saying that I don't have a friend I can call, a person I could talk to, but my greatest advancement is when it's me and God alone. And God doesn't have to be saying anything. He doesn't have to be fixing all my problems. It's just that the way I live, I live in his presence. I live by the way I worship him. And people who live like that, who don't, don't function on bread alone, it's hard to kick them down. And it's hard to keep them down because they always bounce back. They have a, 
a mentality that they will always come back stronger than they were because their source is otherworldly. Their source is not of this world, so this world can't hold them down. They are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so their source is heavenly, and because their source is heavenly, there's nothing this world can do that could really bring them down. They may be down momentarily, but when they are down and they're in that wilderness moment, they will just worship. And what will happen, they will rise again. And when we understand the story of Christ, that he went to the cross, he, he left the cross, went to the grave, left the grave, went into hell. But what makes the story the greatest is that he rose again. And we call that resurrection power. And the Bible says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So we have a resurrection power in us. We have bounced back power. So we don't function by bread alone. We function by that power that's in us that will lift us back up even when we're down. That will repair our marriage even when it's torn that will fix our money even when it's been messed up, that'll fix our mind. All we have to do is have the wisdom to worship in the wilderness. Man shall not live on bread alone. Let's go to uh, verse five. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. This is very important. Verse six, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to any one I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. If you would switch and worship me. So this is what I, I the picture I want to paint to you. When you are a worshiper, Satan knows he can't stop you from worshiping. So instead, what he will attempt to do is get you to worship the wrong thing. To get the worship that should go to God to get you to place it in something else. Because you don't live by bread alone. You tap into other sources. So what Satan will try to do is offer you shortcuts to get what you want by displacing your worship somewhere else. Now, I don't mean to be unfair when I say this, but as a pastor, a youth pastor first and a pastor, I've seen this a lot with women and their relationships. It's not all their fault because number one, the Bible talks about in Genesis when, they, when the ground was cursed and things were cursed, the Bible says that one of the issues with the woman is that her curse was her desire would always be to the man. And so I don't have time to really dig into all of that. But fast forward to what I've seen oftentimes is many times uh, women are well-meaning in talking to God, saying, God, I want someone to help me carry my life out. I don't want to be lonely. So I want a man. I want you to send a man. But when God begins to open up doors and avenues for them to either date, to see people, to connect with people, many times the worship and the attention that they once gave toward God, they shift it toward the man that God allows to come into their life. And that's demonic because what God, is, what God wants us to do is always keep him as first priority. Not only that, I'm going to stay on the women for a second. I've seen it also, women who have a desire to have children and they want God to open their womb and they have children and then their children become their priority because as a mother, that's who they are. They're nurturers. How, however, if it's misplaced, that is also demonic. And what Satan is doing, he's taking something real and righteous and trying to twist it to get it out of order. Men often do that with their work, putting their work in front of God. I've seen many men pray 
for God to give them a job. They just want to work, especially if they were hustling, uh, selling drugs. They got locked up in prison. They come out. They got a fresh start. Man, I just need a job, Pastor. I need you to pray for me to have a job. I got to have some money coming in. I got child support. I got probation fees I got to pay. And then they get a chance to get a job. And sometimes, oftentimes, the way our system's set up, they don't get a job good enough and they'll just go right back to the streets. There's other times that they get a job and they're gainfully employed for the first time. And it blows their minds. Like, man, I can make legitimate money. They feel good about themselves. But then Satan will twist it to get them to worship the job. Now, all they think about is overtime. All they think about is profit share. All they think about is what they can do with the money legally. And God has been put on the back burner. We have to be careful when we are worshipers because we will worship something. If you're a worshiper, you will worship something. That's why it's important to worship in the wilderness because oftentimes in the wilderness, there's no other distraction. Everything else is jacked up. You have no choice but to turn to God. It's good to do that, to learn that so that when you come out of the wilderness, every part of your life is not wilderness experience. Every part of your life is not in the valley. Sometimes you are on the mountaintop. But what you have to understand is if I can worship God in the valley, and I can worship God in the wilderness, then I should be able to worship him on the mountaintop. When I get on the mountaintop, I should not focus on the mountaintop. I should focus on the one that got me to the mountaintop. I shouldn't focus on the man. I should focus on the one who got me the man. I shouldn't focus on the children. I should focus on the one who got me the children. I'm not saying you won't have any focus on the job, any focus on the children, or any focus on the man. They shouldn't be your primary, primary focus because we don't worship things, we worship God. And this is what I see that happened in this last election cycle. Many Christians were convinced that Trump was God sent. And instead of worshiping God, they worshiped the man. And no matter how far he got off and no matter what he did, they always made excuses for it because they got to the place where they were worshiping the man. I can't say that about all people who, who uh, were Trump supporters, but I can say that there were a lot. There were people who did things thinking they were worshiping God and they were actually worshiping man. We have to be careful to, from allowing Satan to displace our worship. Let's go back to what it says. If you worship me, it all will be yours. If you switch your focus from God to these other things, I can get you the stuff that you want. If you stay focused on the job, I can get you the house you want. I can get you the car you want. You stay focused on this man, I can get you to walk down the aisle. There's nothing wrong with those things until you start worshiping them, until you're tempted to worship them. We love God we enjoy things. Have you ever found yourself saying, man, I love my car. Man, I love my job. Man, I love meatloaf. I love lasagna. Nothing wrong with saying those things because it's a figment of speech until it actually becomes truth that you're actually loving objects. The Bible says God gives us all things richly to enjoy. It's okay for us to take pleasure from it enjoy it, but when we love it to the place where it drives us, then we are worshiping it because the Bible says we should have no other gods before us and we should worship him and him only. Our greatest love should go to him. Everything else should be secondary love. It's hard to understand that, but it's truth. The Bible says when it comes to your love and loyalty to Jesus or God, versus what you place to your family, it should almost seem like hate. He says, no one should come to me unless they're able to hate their mother, their father, their brother, their sister. Now, of course, it wasn't talking about hate because God doesn't want us to hate, but compared to the way we give God love and worship, nothing else should feel quite the same. And nobody in your life should demand that from you. Nothing that demands you switch your worship from God to them or it 
is operating godly. They're operating out of the demonic. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve is what the King James says. This is, I believe this is the New International. It says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, our servitude should come to him only. Now, I've talked many times to you about the addiction that I had with pornography before I came to God. And then even while I uh, was with God, there was a relapse and relapses. And what happens when you have something like that, sin like that, the Bible calls it bondage. Sin demands that you serve it. Sin demands that you worship because what it does, it dominates your thoughts. Even though you have godly thoughts in there, it dominates those thoughts to where you begin to serve the sin. You begin to make um, strategy on how you can sin and get away with the sin. You begin to work and then sometimes it just gets out of hand. And I found out that worshiping God is the only way to get out of it because what you're doing, worship, what worship actually means, it means to magnify. And the word magnify means to exalt and enlarge. So once we begin to magnify God, exalt him and enlarge him above all our issues and troubles and hangups and sins, he becomes bigger than everything. And once he becomes bigger than everything, he consumes everything. And there's nothing in your life that can stay that God doesn't want there if you consistently begin to bring him into everything. Even when you're messing up, God, God, I need you to come in. I need you to fix this. God, God, this is what I'm doing. This is where I am. But God, it's not right. I trust you. I say your word is right. God, God, I may be doing this, but I don't agree that it's right. I agree that you're right. I'm the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus, I won't be like this forever. God, deliver me. God, save me. God, I'll worship you for delivering me. I'll worship you for bringing me out. I'll worship you that I won't be like this forever. I'll worship you that I won't need this forever. I'll worship you that I won't crave this forever. And what you're doing, instead of putting all your focus on the failure, you're putting your focus on the God that can bring you out of the failure. I wanted to go to my whiteboard, but I got carried away. I want to put this up on the screen. Wilderness worship is refusing to worship something else to get ahead. And then we use this on Sunday morning. Wilderness worship means no demonic shortcuts. No demonic shortcuts. Anything that the devil is offering that might get us ahead, but it causes us to lose our relationship with God or lower our relationship with God, or put our relationship with God on the back burner is demonic. And let's be honest, we've all been there. We've all got caught in sometimes not sin. The Bible talks about there are sins and there are weights. Sometimes it's just weights. Sometimes it's your phone. It's Facebook. You stayed on Facebook too long when you could have done something else. Sometimes we get carried away, we get caught up. But once we get convicted, we don't buck against it and get defensive, we yield and we worship God by saying, God, you know what? That's right. I, I, I gave too much time to that. I gave too much focus to that. God, what do you want? What do you want from me today? What are we doing today? Have you ever woke up and asked God, what are we doing today? Yeah, I know you're going to work and I know you plan on going to the grocery store and after, but have you ever asked God to interrupt your day? Have you asked, ever asked God to control your day? That's worship. You ask God to have your day, have your way in my life today, God. Is there somebody you want me to talk to? Is there somebody you want me to pray for? Something you want me to do? Can I pay it for some way today? Maybe, yeah, yes, I plan on going to the grocery store, but God, I'm going to be looking for somebody that I can get in line uh, behind and tell, hey, I'm paying for their groceries today. I, what, whatever, I, whatever can I do? And all those things doesn't have to be broadcast on social media. Some of the things you do in an act of worship and reverence to God can be between just you and God because it's not for accolades. It's not for people. It's not for shine. It's to say, God, I worship you. 
even if I have troubles myself, even if I'm in the wilderness myself, God, you are so important to me. You are so valuable to me. I want you to have my day. I want you to take over. And you know what? God doesn't always desire to interrupt your day. God is a gentleman. Sometimes you may say, God, what do you want me to do this month? What do you want me to do this week? And God doesn't give you any instruction other than to just to chill and live. And as you live, he brings things by your day in your life that you think, oh, wow, wait a second. That, that was God. Sometimes weird things happen to me in the sense that I may have a thought about something, you know, just a, a random thought. Like uh, the, the other day, I just had a random thought. It was Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, weekend. It was coming up. It was his actual birthday and the weekend was coming up. And I just began, began to be intrigued about how the FBI treated him and some of the tapes that are out on him and the FBI. Just was a thought that came to my mind. And I was like, maybe one day I'd, I'd, I'd like to read a book about that and see something about it. Came through my mind and left. 15, 20 seconds, I was on to something else. Then I got home and somehow I seen on my uh, phone, I just seen an advertisement about a documentary of Martin Luther King and FBI tapes. And I was thinking, man, I was just thinking about that. And then I was looking on, it was like, oh, it's in theaters. So, you know, uh, it'll be a while before it comes out. And then I see, but if you have Amazon Prime, you can get it now. I happen to have Amazon Prime. And I was like, oh, the very thing that I was thinking about two days ago, now I'm sitting here watching it. And it was just something simple. Sometimes God does simple things like that just makes things happen, makes things work out. And you don't have to be super deep about it, but sometimes you know, it's like, man, how did that work? How did that, it was God that did it. And so you worship him and just by saying, thank you. You're rushing and you need to go to the store and grab something real quick, but you need to be in and out. And while you're getting there, man, Walmart's going to be packed. And all of a sudden, the moment you pull on the aisle, somebody on the very first parking lot is backing up. And there's nobody there to take it. And here you are getting that very first parking spot. You say, God, thank you for this. Because that was God. God cares down to the little details of your life. Everything is not super spiritual. He cares about the small, less minutest detail of your life. And when you see God working in your life, you worship him. You thank him. That's why we don't change and trade for the demonic because the demonic can give us some pleasures momentarily. The Bible says uh, the joys of sin last but for a moment, but the pleasures of God, they last for a lifetime. So I would rather go through life worshiping a God that does little things along the way than to trade it in for a God that can, for a, a, a devil that will promise me something right now. That's a good place for you to say amen, somebody. All right, let's, let's uh, move on. Let's look at Luke 4 and 9. So I'm going to take my time and, and read that one. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, remember he's back to that. He said, throw yourself down from here. Before I, uh, before I discuss that part, what I'd like to say is he starts off with that, if you are the son of God. And then he tries to get him to worship him. And then he goes back to, if you are the son of God, this is something you have to understand. If Satan can get you to worship him, he knows you're not really a son of God because if you worship him, then you don't really have relationship with God. He will always try to get you to do it though. But once Jesus didn't bite on it, he went back to his old thing. Well, if you are the son of God. In other words, what Satan is saying, I know you're a child of God. And so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to challenge that. If you don't bite on that, I'm going to try to get you to worship something else. Because if you worship something else, then you can't be worshiping God. The Bible says you can't worship God and mammon, God and money, God and materials. You, can, you really only have place in your heart. If you're a son of God, a child of God, you only have your place in your heart to worship one thing. So first, he's going to challenge you if you are a son of God. If, you, if it looks like you are, he's going to try to get you to displace your worship. 
If he can't get you to do that, he's going to come back and he's going to challenge your sonship again. So let me say this. If you always deal with the fact, man, I wonder if I'm even saved. I'm, if I was saved, why would I be thinking these thoughts? If you keep coming back to that, it's because you are saved. Because people who are unsaved don't wonder if they are saved or not. They don't care. So the fact that he's challenging your standing with God means you have a standing with God. He tried to get you to take the demonic. You didn't take it. So he's got to go back to the old stuff. He, he's a one trick pony. He's only got a few things. It comes basically down to one simple thing. He's jealous. He was in heaven, got prideful, got kicked out of heaven. He was trying to be like God. And then he got so prideful, he said, I'm better than God. What God did is create someone who was lower than him. Humans are lower than angels. Create someone lower than him, put the image of God in them and give them dominion. So he's been ticked off at us from the beginning. We are slapped in his face because what he wanted, we have. He wanted to be like God and then be better than God. God gives us a chance to be like him and then says with him, we'll always be better because we always will be with him. He was dumb enough to try to be greater than God. God says, you don't have to be greater than me. I'll let you be with me. So he's jealous of us. So everything that he tries to do is to disassociate us with our relationship with God. Continually worshiping God deepens and strengthens the relationship. So he's always going to try to test and tempt you to break relationship with God. If you don't break it, the only thing he has left is trying to convince you that you're not what God says you are. You're not saved. You got angry. You cussed. You lied. You ain't got nothing. You ain't anointed. I, I know you can fool the folk in the church, but I know who you really are. But guess what? God knows who I really am. God knows I'm a mess and he allows me to worship him in my mess. Worshiping is lifting our heart to God. Here's the thing about life. Sometimes things get in our mind. The Bible tells us this. I don't have time to really break it down. But if they stay in our mind long enough, they get into our heart. The scripture says it this way. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then Jesus said, we're not defiled by what goes in our mouth. We're defiled by what comes out of our heart because our heart shows what's really in us. So me eating pork, even though pork is not the greatest meat in the world, is not going to send me to hell. Having bad thoughts that set up in my heart have a greater chance of sending me to hell because I can be defiled in my heart. But what worship does, we lift our heart to God. So even when our heart gets jacked up, we lift it to God and say, God, Touch my heart. First thing to, to get into a relationship with God, we say, God, come into my life. Come into my heart. But every time we worship God, we lift up our heart. One scripture says, we lift up our heart with our hands. We lift up our hands without wrath and doubting. And so when we are worshiping God, that's why we lift our hands in worship. But even the way we worship with our lifestyle is a lifting up of our heart. And even if there's anything in our heart that's not like God, number one, God dwells in our heart. Number two, we lift our heart up to him and saying, God, this is now your mess, not my mess. Yeah, yeah. I, maybe the thoughts that I thought that I was thinking that got in my heart, maybe I caused this, but this ain't my problem to fix because you're the one who said that you could cleanse me of all unrighteousness. So when I worship you, I worship you as a cleaner. I worship you as a fixer-up. I worship you as a deliverer. I worship you as one who loves me enough to fix me. You ever seen that show, Flip My House? Well, God is a flip my heart type of God. I don't care how messed up my heart may get. If I continue to worship him and continue giving him a chance and continue offering myself up before him, he will flip me. He will deliver me. He will repair me. He will restore me. The Bible calls it restoration. The Bible also calls it reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And it's given to us the same ministry of reconciliation. 
He is always reconciling us. Reconcile is actually a financial term. It means where debts are, that they are being reconciled. They are being fixed. The books are being fixed because someone is paying the price. Well, God already paid the price and he has an unlimited supply. So when I worship him, even if myself is messed up, up, he still is willing to pay the price. Why would I not worship a God like this? Why would I not love a God like this? Why would I not serve a God like this? And let me turn a corner. Why, if I was Satan, why would I not try to stop you for being in relationship with a God like this? Don't get mad at Satan. He's doing his job. If I was Satan, I would come against me too because God loves me and I love God. And I tried to break that up any way I could. But the problem is for Satan, he can't do it as long as I promise that I will worship in the wilderness. As long as I promise that I would keep giving him everything, Satan always, 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 always loses. Say that with me. Satan always loses. I think I'm going to uh, type that in the comments. I, I like that. Uh, I'm going to come over here and type that into the comments. Satan always loses. That's better than that's better than the whiteboard. I'll just put it in the comments right there. Satan always loses, especially if we're worshipers, especially if we give God our all. I think I'm going to take that and put it on the screen just so we can look at it and see it. Satan always loses. Something that I like to do, <laughs> I like to put Satan's name in lower. Cap. I don't like putting a capital S on him. I always put a capital God, capital G on God, but not for Satan. He gets a small S because he always loses. But the Bible says this. It says we always triumph in Christ Jesus. So let's, let me, let me type that up again. I, I see you guys are doing the same thing. So let me put that up. What you guys are saying. Satan always loses. But with God, we always win. Let me add that to the conversation. With God, we always win. Satan always loses, but with God, we always win. So if you're a winner, you should be a worshiper. If you already know the outcome, you already know you're going to win, we are going to win, worship God now. Worship him for what you know is coming. Everything's not going to be fixed, but we worship in the wilderness. It's okay. We always win and Satan always loses. So we worship God. We worship God. I just want you to let that sink in your spirit that we always win and Satan always loses. Let's go into prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you. God, we honor you that we have the right to worship you. There's nobody akin to you, nobody like unto you. And the, the, the pathway of worship is the only pathway because what we're saying is, God, you are always worthy no matter what we're going through. We don't have to wait till we win to show you and prove that we know, God, that you are worthy. God, you are always worthy and you always cause us to triumph. We always win. Satan is never worthy. And so we will give you the worship and we won't exchange our worship for anybody but you. Because you are our life. And for that, we praise you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Saints, all I got to say is God bless you. Have a great week. We love you and we honor you. And we thank you for tuning in to DT Bible Study. Mm -hmm.